The 12 Pro Max is now the ultimate power in the iPhone universe. Come on, you knew that was coming. Oh, wait, one second. Just putting my face where my review is. Sponsored by CuriosityStream. I've already covered all the basics of the iPhone 12 Pro in my mega review. Everything from the new squared off design and finishes to the OLED displays, to the camera systems, including Dolby Vision, HDR recording, the A14 Bionic, 5G, MagSafe accessories, all of it. So I won't waste your time just going over it again here. Just make sure you hit the subscribe button and bell and check out that video, my iPhone 12 mini review, which should be up around the same time as this and all the longer term tests and reviews I have coming your way soon. The iPhone 12 Pro Max is hundred bucks more than the iPhone 12 Pro non-max, regular, normal, single adjective. And yes, wow, these names are getting cumbersome. I'd love it if we could just distill everything down to iPhone mini, iPhone Air, iPhone Pro, and iPhone Max, but I don't every time get what I want. Anyway, SIM free and flat out, that's 1100 bucks US for 128 gigabytes, 1200 for 256 gigabytes, and 1400 for 512 gigabytes. No one terabyte option like the iPad Pro, at least not yet, but that's it. For everything, all the extras, everything I'm about to go over, the cost differential is just 100 bucks, just 220 over the 128 gigabyte iPhone 12 non-pro, non-max, which is kind of wild. As much as the regular prices have gone up, the pro prices just haven't. And that's caused some people to look and think, the features and prices are just so close. There's not much difference. They can just go with the lower cost version and save a hundred bucks. But others to look at them and think, the features and prices are so close, there's not much difference. They can just go with the better version for only a hundred bucks more. And both are totally valid perspectives. But I'm a glass half full type, so I figure if I'm gonna go as far as the 12, I might as well go that one more step to 12 Pro, then maybe that one last step to the 12 Pro Max which is probably exactly why they're all priced this way this year. And I understand, seriously understand that even $100 more may be way too much for some people, 10% on an already $1,000 phone. But if you really want the size and feature set, what with trade-ins and installments and upgrade programs, the difference over the course of a year, never mind several years, isn't gonna be that much. So if price isn't a concern, it also isn't a huge barrier to jumping up to the iPhone 12 Pro Max. It's hardly any barrier this year at all, especially not if you've already decided to go pro. The real barrier, at least for me, and enticement, as always, is the size. Take the iPhone 12 Pro, make the screen bigger, more than ever before, and make the cameras better in ways Apple simply never done before, and you have the iPhone 12 Pro Max a hybrid of the previous two Max models where there was just no difference other than size and the old Plus models where the bigger phones also had slightly better cameras. And it's like switching from a car to a Jeep or an SUV, one that's, yes, a lot to handle and park around town, but it's also absolutely and exactly what you want when you go off-roading or on long trips, when you just gotta work. Less a phone and more a tiny tablet a primary computing device that you can do almost anything on from almost anywhere you need to. Now, this year's Max isn't that much more Max, not really. The display has gone from 6.5 to 6.7 inches, but some of that is thanks to the new design and the slightly thinner bezels. It's a bit taller, a bit heavier, but negligibly wider and actually slightly thinner than the previous Max models. It does feel more substantial though, because of the new more squared off design but somehow less dense, probably because of the surface to depth ratio. All this to say, if you've been fine with the other Max or Plus iPhones or any of the similar or even larger sized Android phones, you'll be just fine with the iPhone 12 version. There's also less of a difference between the regular Pro and the Pro Max this year, because instead of a 5.8 inch display, like the 10, 10S and 11 Pro, the 12 Pro has gone up to 6.1 inches, like the 10R and 11. So if you've been using a non-Max or Plus iPhone, the difference between a 6.1 inch iPhone 10R and 11, even a 12 if you're trying to decide between the two, isn't trivial, but also isn't as extreme as it is from the older, smaller flagship iPhones. Still, while I can hold an iPhone 12 Pro Max one-handed, especially if I balance it on my pinky and just finger jitsu some of the basic things that way, to use it quickly, to use it efficiently, 
to hit all the interface elements in all the corners, I really do need to use two hands. To me, for me, it's absolutely less of that phone and more of that tiny tablet. But for that extra size, I get a ton of extra screen real estate. And the difference isn't so much in pixel count, an extra 246 vertical and 114 horizontal between the Pro and the Pro Max, and only 10 and six between the 11 Pro Max and the 12 Pro Max. The difference is mostly physical size. In some cases, depending on the app, that translates into more text on the screen and more items and lists. In other cases, the same, sometimes even less if the app goes for bigger instead of more. And that's what makes the iPhone 12 Pro Max a great choice for anyone who doesn't just want, but needs a bigger display. Because if the default size isn't enough, display zoom will let you blow up the regular iPhone 12 interface to a much easier to see size and accessibility lets you increase text even further while still keeping a good amount of it on the screen at any given time. And yeah, things like videos and games are just always bigger. Not the same as an iPad, even the 7.9 inch iPad mini, because iPads have a much taller aspect ratio of four by three, where modern iPhones are closer to two by one. So iPads remain better at multi-column, old school TV, books and comic books, and iPhones at single column, cinematic video, lists and messaging. Like previous Plus and Mac sizes, the iPhone 12 Pro Max will try to give you a little bit of that iPad flavor in landscape mode, popping up an iPad style split view with a list on the left and details on the right, but it's not always there, not always consistent. And where did the old Plus landscape home screen go? Is it unemployed in Greenland? iOS 14 picture in picture works terrifically well on the big screen, of course, and makes me long for not side-by-side -side apps because of the aspect ratio, but maybe top and bottom apps. And just come on iOS 15, you know you want it too. Overall though, it comes down to practicality versus productivity. If you find the iPhone 12 Pro Max size just too cumbersome to use, you won't enjoy it no matter how useful it could be. And if it's no problem to handle, then it'll let you handle more than ever. It's funny, computer Twitter has been annoyed by the highest end iPhone pricing for just years. Complaining a Mac's cost the same as a Mac now, at least a MacBook Air. Photography Twitter though, has been waking up to this totally different perspective, that the iPhone, especially the Pro, and now extra especially the Max, have really good cameras, and really, really good video cameras, and they cost only a fraction of the price of most of the new dedicated cameras that have been coming out this summer. Sometimes less than a single lens for one of those cameras and the iPhone comes with three. Now, I know they're not the same thing, not at all, not even remotely, but kinda. Increasingly, the iPhone Pro is finding its way into Pro Video workflows, not because it can do everything a DSLR or mirrorless, God, Cinecam can do, but because it can do some things they can't more easily and absolutely less expensively. Now, when it comes to the iPhone 12 Pro Max camera specifically, you get the same 13 millimeter f2.4, 120 degree ultra wide as you do all the other iPhone 12 models, all the way down to the mini with smart HDR3, which lets you capture detail in shadows and highlights beyond what even most big sensors in glass can easily capture because big compute and also deep fusion for better texture in low light and night mode for when there's almost no light. And these features are just across all the cameras now, even the front. Same LiDAR scanner as on the regular Pro as well. The one that allows for fast autofocus and portrait mode in low light and much faster augmented reality surface acquisition in daylight. Also new with iOS 14.2, people detection in the Magnifier app. It's from Apple's supremely genius accessibility team and will help those with no or low vision just avoid collisions and maintain safe physical distancing in lines and other public spaces, which is critical during a pandemic the 26 millimeter F1.6 wide angle camera is where the differences start on the Pro Max. It's got bigger 1.7 micron pixels compared to the 1.4 micron pixels on the regular Pro, which means it can take in more light. The OIS or optical image stabilization is also sensor shift on the Max now, like the IBIS or in-body image stabilization you find on higher end dedicated cameras. Basically, instead of the lens just floating to cancel out sensor movement, the sensor itself floats, which is mechanically simpler and yeah, optically better. It's not something you'll need or maybe even appreciate all the time. I mean, in daytime, it doesn't matter. A potato can take good photos in the daytime. 
but when it's not quite night mode, that's where the Max shines. And that includes a lot of lower light indoor situations that a lot of us are finding ourselves in these days. Apple has also announced a Pro RAW format for later in the year, which promises the flexibility of RAW with the power of computational photography. Basically, letting you step through and tweak the process. And I can't wait to test this out and see what it can really do, and I'll cover all of that in a follow-up review. The 52 millimeter telephoto is not 52 millimeters anymore on the Max. It's 65 millimeters now, which means it has even more compression and less distortion, which can be really nice for portraits and product shots. The downside is, instead of an f2.0 aperture, it's an f2.2 aperture, which means it's not as good in low light. Still, I love the way it frames. Because of the length, it steps up to 2.5x, not just 2x like on Apple's previous telephoto camera systems. And it's kind of surprising and delightful how much difference that actually makes. And yeah, even though Apple's doing a much better job with smart HDR and deep fusion on digital zoom, I'm still really missing much better optical zoom on iPhones, the kind you're finding on Samsung phones these days. I'm not saying periscope lends me, but something. I do really love, just all caps love, the natural bokeh you can get off of 65 millimeter though. I mean, portrait mode is fine and computational photography never ceases to fascinate me, but there's just nothing that matches what you get off glass. And all the same things apply to video as well, including the new 4K60 Dolby Vision HDR mode, high dynamic range. I really truly intensely wish Apple had a button on the main camera app to toggle it on and off, like they recently added for the resolution and frame rate. And I'm still waiting on proper Final Cut Pro 10 support, like Judge Judy just slapping her watch.gif gif. But the 10 bit dynamic range is gorgeous. And the 6.7 inch display makes for a terrific viewfinder. I mean, camera nerds like me pay hundreds and hundreds of dollars to slap a small HD or similar bigger display on our cameras. And this one is OLED HDR, does real time preview for computational modes. So what you see is what you shoot and it comes built in, which is just one more thing that helps explain the differences in perceived value. And videography in general is where the bigger size really doesn't matter either because most cameras are way bigger, some enormously bigger. And by comparison, even the iPhone 12 Pro Max is ridiculously light and combined with its dynamic range makes it incredibly easy to get into any space and do almost any type of shot, especially when you use a gimbal or just the new IBIS and stabilize in post. It's not just slick, it's actually sick. That all said, none of these are major differences. They're small, nerdy, interesting things that appeal to me because I love exactly these kinds of small, nerdy, interesting things. They're fresh, they're fun. They let me stretch my creative potential to just think up new things to do. But if nothing I said here interests you, not in the slightest, then you can just scratch camera completely off your max list and decide based on size alone. For me though, the camera is a decision. I need to shoot a lot more with it to be sure, but I wanna shoot a lot more with it. And so far, I like the telephoto, even if it is a real trade-off between length and speed. The wide angle though, the wide angle is just pure win, at least when it comes to delivering on that promise of more better photos under more wider conditions. You do not understand the power of the A14 Bionic, is what I'd say if I hadn't just completely exhausted my allotment of Star Wars jokes for these reviews. But the A14 chipset with its quad ice storm efficiency cores, dual firestorm performance cores, custom quad core GPU, DECA hexa, whatever 16 core neural engine, and more controller, accelerator, and special purpose IP than you can shake a benchmark at is in all the iPhone 12s from the mini to the Pro Max. And like the Pro, the Pro Max has six gigabytes of memory, which is terrific because iPhones don't have to deal with interpreters or garbage collection or the lack of optimization that comes from having to support just a wide and eclectic range of hardware. So they just don't need as much RAM as other phones, but they do have to deal with cross-platform, cross-compiled games and really sloppy social media apps and that's where the six gigabytes really shines. Everything from Twitter to Instagram, and I can only imagine Facebook, and Pokemon Go just stay in memory longer and resume without restart far more often. It's only a few seconds difference per jetsamed app switch, but those seconds add up. 
And I think special relativity has a whole subclause that says observing a relaunch makes seconds feel like minutes. And when you're in a hurry, just basically forever. In terms of performance, the iPhone 12 Pro Max works the same as the non-Max, even the mini. And that's incredible because it's better than a lot of laptops these days. And that includes, sure, benchmarks, but things like video rendering from iMovie. It just doesn't get as hot as the mini does while doing it. And that's probably just because of the bigger thermal envelope. And yes, I still use Pokemon Go as my stress test because yes, it still hits the screen, processor, wireless, GPS, basically everything that radiates harder than anything else anywhere nearly as fun. And after five hours, the iPhone 12 Pro Max was still at 75%. That compares to 70% for the iPhone 12 and iPhone 12 Pro and 50% for the iPhone 12 mini, which is probably just the size of the iPhone 12 Pro Max's battery. Apple rates the iPhone 12 Pro Max at 20 hours for local video, 12 for streaming and 80 for audio. That's three hours, one hour, and 15 hours more than the regular Pro, and five, two, and 30 hours more than the mini. It's also the same as Apple rated the iPhone 11 Pro Max, though in my tests, at least so far, the iPhone 12 Pro Max doesn't last quite as long. Part of that might just be the extra efficiency of the A14 not completely trading off against the smaller battery size necessitated by the thinner build, the new MagSafe system, and a lot by the new Qualcomm X55 modem and the 5G that comes with it. I only have FR1, frequency range one, where I live, the low and mid bands, but I get roughly two times faster speeds in LTE at the cost of slightly higher battery drain. If you're one of the few who have FR2, frequency range two in the US, the high bands typically called millimeter wave, it'd likely be slightly higher. And PSA, yes, you can't do 5G on dual SIM, not yet, because Qualcomm wrote the feature down on the spec sheet, but hasn't actually shipped it yet. I'll shilling to the contrary, notwithstanding. Something iPhone users are discovering, but Android users have been complaining about for months already. Apple is though apparently pushing hard for it to be shipped soon. The Pro Max, like all the other iPhones 12, works with the new MagSafe magnetic inductive charging system, including the new MagSafe Duo, which is coming out right about now. It can also fast charge up to 50% in 30 minutes with Apple's new, but not included in the box, 20 watt AC adapter. And yeah, I'd absolutely love a next generation MagSafe smart battery for the iPhone 12 Pro Max as well, because when I'm out shooting, there's just never enough battery, not ever. And being able to slap on a pack rather than wire up a brick uh, would be heavier, sure, but still so much better for shooting. But the bottom line is bigger is still just more, especially with the regular Pro hurting a bit on battery life, thanks to the new build and especially 5G, the Max is really truly Max. So should you upgrade? I'd say if you're on one of the previous Maxes, then no, you're fine. The tech industry obsesses over, almost fetishizes year over year upgrades and focuses on them in a way that TVs, appliances, and car industries simply don't. But you should always wait as long as you can to upgrade, upgrade only when you really need to, and then enjoy that upgrade for as long as you can before you upgrade again. If you're on an annual program, or if you sell every year to buy new, or you're just a giant tech nerd who wants the latest and greatest, or money is simply no object, then you're buying anyway. Apple had you at good morning. If you're on one of the older plus sized iPhones though, especially the six or 6S, but up to the seven and eight, or if you're on a smaller iPhone, but have wanted to go big and the camera features are interesting enough to just push you over the edge, then the iPhone 12 Pro Max is one hell of an upgrade. And for me, that's exactly what it's all about. That's why I'm personally going Max this year. It's a little extra for me, but I really want the best camera and the bigger battery. And I'll take the bigger display as a bonus because who just doesn't love a bonus, especially with Nebula, the streaming platform I'm building along with my education creator friends, Alex, a low spec gamer, Jordan Harrod, Tech Alter, Epos Vox, Real Engineering, Real Science, and just so many more. It's a place where we don't need to worry about demonetization or the tyranny of the click through rate or watch time or algorithms or ads where you can find all of my videos just completely ad free, including the new podcast I've started with Georgia Dow, Apple Talk, which has a bonus topic only available on Nebula. So what does it have to do with CuriosityStream? Well, as the go-to source for the best documentaries on the internet, 
They just love educational content and thoughtful creators. And so we worked out this deal where if you sign up for CuriosityStream with the link in the description, not only will you get CuriosityStream, but you'll also get a Nebula subscription for free. And for a limited time, CuriosityStream is offering 26% off all of their annual plans. And 26% off is just the best deal you'll find anywhere. So click the link in the description and get both CuriosityStream and Nebula for 26% off. Or you can go to curiositystream.com slash Rene Ritchie. It's a great way to support this channel and educational content directly for just $14.79 per year. Per year. Just click on the link in the description or go to curiositystream.com slash Rene Ritchie. And clicking on that link really helps out this channel. For a ton more on the iPhone 12s, all of them, check out the playlist above, including the Pro and Pro Max models, unboxing, reviews, comparisons, and more. Just click the playlist and I'll see you next video.